Uh, well, the one thing that I feel like is sort of a healthy tendency with DSA is is because this is what kind of our this episode is about is, is the founder Michael Harrington, uh, who founded it. But I think something that I like about it is you go to a DSA meeting, you're not saluting a picture of Michael Harrington on the wall. He's mm-hmm. not you know venerated. He's no Baba Vakian or anything, right? This is not a a cult of personality. Uh, if anything, it's he's um, closer to being burned in effigy by a lot of uh, by a lot of members. Um, and so, you know, I was not super familiar with his life really until I started reading up for this. I'd hear heard things here and there. One, I remember once doing a reading group, and there was something. I think uh, past and future socialism, some one of that, those books, yep. and uh, reading a section from it, I was actually pretty surprised at how radical it was because sort of what you hear about him in sort of DSA circles from new members anyway is that uh, he was basically just a liberal, right? He was to the right of Bernie Sanders, basically is is how it's pitched uh, a lot of times, and um, what I guess for. People who are some sort of coming at it from my vantage point. Uh, who was Michael Harrington, and uh, what are some of the uh, important things that we should know about him as current sure. members? So I think what's important to remember, and I'll make three points now that I'm kind of going to come back to. Sure. Uh, one touching upon what you just said now, which I. I feel that Michael Harrington is portrayed as more moderate and conservative by two people, two, two kinds of people. One, the leftists you're talking about, the people who think they're to the left of DSA, but are also in DSA, uh-huh. uh, not. And also lots of ex-socialists, left liberals who were in DSA, who I think both have incentives. And I think that's important for readers to know that people have like incentives to like portray him as moderate. And one, to be like, why is DSA betraying the Harrington I know? And they create a character, those are the people on the right. Or two or the people who are like, DSA is in, has broken from Harrington. It's a new organization. So that's one thing. The other thing is I think it's important to remember, and we'll get into, I think, later in the show, that Harrington and DSOC, which was the, one of the predecessor organizations to DSA, we'll get into what those acronyms mean, you know, really are products of the political era they're in. There's a Cold War. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, like the parties, the main parties in this country exist in very different ways than they did now, which we'll get into um, as well. And I think lastly, what I'll say, and then I'll get into who he is too, is like what we, we're going to talk about too is like a realignment strategy, which was like a strategy that was pursued to cut to what I would say to transform the Democratic Party in the United States, not into a socialist party, which I think is a misconception, mm-hmm. but into a European style welfare state, social democratic party. And I think what was valuable about that was it was a strategy and we'll go into like what's actually a strategy. It failed, but it was like a noble attempt. And I think what DSA can learn from that is I, DSA, a lot of electoral work I feel right now is, are very good tactics in search of a strategy. So we have tactics and a long-term goal of building a socialist party, but we don't actually have an exact strategy. And I think our 2021 convention reflected that of like people don't actually agree on the midterm what to do. They agree of what to do now. They agree kind of what we want. And then there's this mm-hmm. like middle that we kind of like comes, we'll see what happens. And yeah. so, so to get into Harrington and, I would recommend uh, for your listeners who haven't and to listen to your good interview with Jim Scheibel, but I think really helps uh, provide some context about who Harrington was in terms of like people who were influenced by him. Uh, was Michael Harrington who was a guy born in Missouri <laughs> uh, and during the just I think around the Great Depression mm-hmm. to uh, to kind of petty bourgeois uh, Irish Catholic family. So not somebody who was going to be part of the elite. He wasn't a wasp, but he also wasn't suffering by any stretch of the imagination and his Catholicism, which he later abandons pretty in life, you know, probably uh, in his twenties, um, in is an atheist for the rest of his life, but has a profound effect on what he cares about. Um, he goes to Jesuit education. He goes to Holy cross, uh, in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, cause his parents only let him go to a Catholic school. So he went as far away as possible. Um, and then he kind of tries some different degrees, goes to law school for a year, gets a master's in, I think, you know, writing, um, but really is kind of a wayward soul and finds uh, Dorothy Day uh, and, and, and her Catholic worker movement and spends a few years there while he still has the faith um, in New York, uh, working with the poor, uh, really being, and, and people don't know, you have to like 
give up your possessions when you join a movement, then you take on the clothes uh, that they have available that the poor have discarded. It's really like a kind of like a borderline monk life in a certain mm. way. And he and he he does that for a few years and he ends up abandoning it. And I think a very funny anecdote is when Dorothy, he goes to tell Dorothy Day, he's like, I'm like going to leave. And she says, is it because of a woman? And he goes, no, I just don't believe it anymore. <laughs> and she goes, OK, good. Because like what what he, what, he, what they explain is like it's because as long as he wasn't sinning, it's okay to like leave. If he was as long as really? he's losing the faith is much different than being a sinner. Um, and so he ends up getting recruited by uh, the into the Young People's Socialist League. And he was not celibate for the rest of his life. For, no, he was not. children. Okay. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he was definitely not. Um, and <laughs> and he um, and he joins the Young People's Socialist League which is kind of independent at that point, but had been part of the Socialist Party of America. And this is, I think, key to also his formation, the other part of the Socialist, the first part kind of discussing, he's very profoundly impacted by anti-poverty uh, work. And then the other is that he joins a kind of this weird sect, um, which, you know, at the time of McCarthyism, doesn't have more than a few hundred people at most, um, which is profoundly like committed to socialism and also that socialism is not the Soviet Union. So there's like mm. really what identifies them. And it's not even though I probably am like jokingly say I'm the last hiring tonight. I think while I kind of might agree with some of their assessments of the Soviet Union, that's not as that's not like what drives me in the way it really drove that generation because they were like, we are like anti Stalinist. And I think it's important to remember he's around folks who found this movie, uh, magazine that's around DSA called Dissent. And Dissent is about dissenting from McCarthyism mm -hmm. and Stalinism. So yeah. that's a kind of good frame to think about what kind of political space these democratic socialists want to take up in the United States. Um, but what he's most famous for is not being a leftist leader by any stretch of the imagination, especially what I've described as pretty marginal politics. It's that he... Um, begins writing about poverty and then puts it into a small accessible book called The Other America, which sells four million copies, which you can imagine in a country that's probably at, the, at most at half the size of the United States. I mean, it would have been a bestseller today, and it was mm -hmm. a huge seller then. And what's key is that he is either Kennedy, John Kennedy gets the book or he gets a review of the book. Um, and it's always important to remember, even though he knows intellectually, there's no internet then. So it's like, it's not like the president's reading white papers and stuff yeah. like so for to get something in front of him is a big deal because he had his full attention. Um, and that's when what Kennedy used kind of is the, the apocryphal stories. That's what helped spark the war on poverty. I think we understand, of course, we take a step back, you know, and what we'll get into is the Democratic basis. Kennedy has to deliver after eight years of Republican rule to the Democratic base of all races and, and also to in the Cold War dealing with, you know, that it's an embarrassment <laughs> that the United States has so many poor people uh, while the Soviet Union and these other communist states are like trying to eradicate poverty and like yeah. we are not dealing with our poverty. So can, so Harrington is also because he's an Irish, it's both, this is where his Irish Catholicism is helpful. You know, he's welcomed in Kennedy's, you know, inner circle for a time and then into Lyndon Johnson's administration after the assassination to take part in what begins drafting uh, the war on poverty. But he's eventually, I think what's important to remember too, is like he's part of this leadership, but then he eventually gets iced out because he like wants more yeah. and more. And there was a funny anecdote uh, that I was doing in my research for this where like Harrington says to uh, John Kennedy's uh, uh, brother-in-law, who was part of this team, and he's like, I think they're nickel and diming uh, us. And, and Shriver says, well, I've never spent a billion dollars. Have you? And it shows <laughs> that, like, you know, the scale of spending was super large. But even Harrington knew at the time it wasn't going to be uh, sufficient. And right. I think the, well, and so that does develop great society programs that do have some limit, um, but are do reflect kind of, I think, the welfare state reputation that you, you and I were talking about before. And then I think what people get where, you know, it's it's a product of also the United States. It's like what gets passed are not universal. They're very, what I would say, fit into the John Lockean view, which I'll just say is just like, there are only three deserved poor people. There's like children, the invalids, and old people. So we have like Medicare for old people. We have like Medicaid for super poor people and everyone else, good luck. I mm -hmm. hope you have an employer plan. Um, and there's other works projects too. And then, but this gives him a reputation that um, I'll stop, kind of stop here to let's see if you have any more questions, but that gives him a national profile that he can use 
uh, to build the socialist movement. I think, um, and then he really, but he, what's interesting is he stays with the socialist party, and we'll get into this too, which I think, especially in the foreign policy, as a party is totally in decline. And what's and for its important political context, the 60s are a time of huge radicalization. And it's like the Socialist Party is like not growing. <laughs> and it's mm-hmm. like, and it's like why and the Socialist Party just totally misses the boat. And I think understanding why it misses the boat is key to understanding like I think some of his mistakes, some of the way he tries to overcorrect and how that gets played into DSA.